Hello, thank you all for joining us again this afternoon. I would like to start with a brief introduction of our guest today. Mr. Derek Lindo is an eighth grade United States history teacher in Owensboro, Kentucky. He graduated from Kentucky Wesleyan College in 2010 with a Bachelor of Arts in History and holds a Master's in Education from the University of the Cumberland. He is currently obtaining a Master of Arts in History from Western Kentucky University. He is the 2015 Dr. Tom and Betty Lawrence National History Teacher Award recipient from the National Society of the Sons of the American Re Revolution. He is also the 2019 James Madison Fellow for the State of Kentucky. Derek is the creator and co-administrator from the Western Theater and the Civil War website, which brings together authors and historians to write about the crucial area of the war. The Kentucky native is married to his lovely wife, Allie, and is the father of two boys, Ezra and Owen. So if you'd like to join me for warm welcoming, Mr. Derek Lindo. Um, so actually, before we get further here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Johnson and Martin here. I'm um, leaving here on Martin because most people probably haven't seen him all that. Uh, but Johnson and Martin, they are not just um, here by accident uh, in 1862. When the war starts, Johnson is in Texas, and uh, he'd been living out there for several years before the war started and really learning a lot. Uh, he has several brushes with Native Americans out on the uh, Texas frontier. He really learns, that's how he really learns how to fight, and he brings all those lessons back here uh, when the war begins. But he's doing just about any kind of type of job that you can imagine for somebody who is living on the frontier. And when the war begins, he makes his way back to Kentucky. Uh, he had five, uh, actually four brothers. He was one of five boys. Uh, two of his brothers are with him in Texas, and they join um, Texas Confederate regiments. And two of his other brothers that remained up here in Kentucky joined Union Kentucky Regiment. So the Johnson family from Henderson is definitely your, your classic Kentucky uh, family that is father versus son, brother versus brother. Because Johnson, even though he eventually joins the Confederate Army, his parents are very strong Unionists. And um, if you ever read Johnson's book, which by the way, you have to take it with a grain of salt, he uh, loves to exaggerate things. Uh, but Johnson, he does talk about, you know, he's, before he officially joins the Confederate Army, he goes back to Henderson and, and he has a dinner with his parents and his brothers and they kind of talk about, if we see each other on the battlefield, let's promise not to shoot each other. And uh, you know, he, he kind of mentions that a little bit throughout uh, his, uh, his experiences, especially at Fort Donaldson. But Martin, he, uh, he joins up in 1861, and uh, he is going to begin the war as a scout for Nathan Bedford Forrest when Forrest is in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. That is when Johnson and Martin meet. Um, when Johnson comes back up to Kentucky, there's some thought, you know, he might have been a little... Um, on the fence about what side he really wanted to support, and maybe he was going home to talk to his parents about that. But before um, he's swayed to the Union side, uh, he does meet some of his friends in Bowling Green, a Confederate occupied Bowling Green, Kentucky, and they could tell him, you know, you got to go meet this one person that we think you'll like him, and that's that's Forrest. Which at that time, you know, Forrest was not the well-known figure that he eventually becomes later on. But uh, he meets Forrest, and Forrest is in need of scouts. And Johnson, being from the Western Kentucky area, he really knows this this part of the state. And so he and Martin meet for the first time. They immediately hit it off and become just great friends. Uh, some of the things they do together uh, in the early part of the war is also some of that stuff that seems better suited for movies than you know, actual history. Um, Johnson claims he pretends to be one of his brothers in the Union Army several times, and <clears throat> steals horses that way, and gets food from unsuspecting Unionists in Kentucky. But how much of that actually happened, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell since Johnson does like to make some things up every now and then. All right, so uh, I like to, this, this chart that I have here, I call it the spectrum of Confederate irregulars. Because when we're dealing with this part of Kentucky and this part of the war, the Confederates that are there are not your normal Confederate soldier. Uh, those particular types are with the armies, um, wherever they might be at this particular time. Um, so one thing that, I was seeing a lot during the research is that in the northern press they were always referencing Johnson as a gorilla and I mean a lot of the things he did are things that gorillas would do um, you know, they're not uniform they blend in with the population whenever they need to but that's not exactly what Johnson was uh, what he is is going to be more towards this 
direction, and that's a partisan ranger. So just to kind of explain what these different ones are. Uh, regular cavalry, those are the men that are in your typical uh, Confederate cavalry regiments, uh, and those are usually always with the army, screening the army, watching the army's flanks, things like that. Uh, a raider, think of John Morgan, think of Forrest. They're detached from the army a lot, and they're usually sent on um, expeditions behind Union lines to disrupt supply lines, but they always return. Uh, so that's kind of what your, your raider is. And then you have your partisan ranger. And partisan rangers are raised and equipped and uh, operate behind Union lines. They are not raised with the regular army. Um, they are meant to fight near their homes, but they are sworn official Confederate soldiers. They just don't look the part, and they don't typically act the part. So um, these men uh, are organized into companies. They have officers, non-commissioned officers. They're in, and then those companies are organized into a regiment, which is what Johnson is going to command eventually. And the thing about partisan rangers is even though they typically operate alone and independently, if they are ordered back to the army, then they are required to follow that order. A lot of the men don't like that, but that is what they do. And so what we'll see about these particular group, this particular group of partisan rangers, which becomes the 10th Kentucky Partisan Rangers, they will eventually go back to the uh, Confederate Army of Tennessee, which was then at uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So uh, that's kind of, we'll see how that goes. But if we were to go a little bit further down the spectrum, that's where you're gonna start seeing your gorilla, your bushwhacker. Uh, the gorillas, they, they are always independent. Uh, they're not in huge groups, like you would see the Partisan Rangers. Uh, they don't take orders from the army. They're not sworn Confederate soldiers, and uh, sometimes they will attach themselves to regular Confederate units when they're in the area. But oftentimes they like that independence, and they obviously are not going to be following any official orders coming their way. But then you've got the what you might call a brigand or an outlaw, and those people are the ones that are uh, really just taking advantage of the war to kill and steal and settle old scores and just wreak havoc because it's a war on and they feel like they have that, uh, uh, that ability to do that at that time. So what we'll see throughout this is the, the Union press typically views Johnson as a guerrilla. Uh, they call him a guerrilla all the time. Even Union uh, soldiers call them guerrillas because that was just the word, the blanket term they used for everybody that was operating behind Union lines. So there, these are some images that you can find in period newspapers. Uh, the one on the left just shows some guerrillas holding somebody up on the road. Uh, probably stealing some things, and when you look into the different accounts that are down in the, especially the Owensboro, Henderson area, that sort of thing seemed to happen a lot. <coughs> Were they with Johnson's men or not? Uh, you know, it's, it's up for debate, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and then this one over here on the right. What was interesting about this one is that it came out about the same time that our story takes place. And the description for it was a, uh, a Kentucky town. Uh, from under guerrilla control. And so really the only irregulars operating in Western Kentucky at this time were, was, was Johnson. But you know, when you take a closer look at the picture, I mean, you've got, there's a dead dog, there's a man hanging from the flag post. There's a lot of horrible things going on, um, a lot of things on fire in the background, but Johnson's men never did anything quite like that. Uh, none of their, the towns they uh, attacked really were, were burned. Uh, that sort of thing didn't happen. A lot of stealing happened, but it's nothing that's really depicted there in that particular picture because Martin and Johnson knew bad press was bad for recruiting. So they wanted to keep a, as much of a positive image as they could so they could bring in more recruits and get the help of the local population. All right, so before we uh, really get into the story, I just want to show what these men looked like. Um, this particular picture you can find in Johnson's book, and the only uh, description for it is partisan rangers in camp. He doesn't say what year it is. He doesn't say where they're at. Uh, I'm wondering if this is not a picture that was taken in prison uh, after a lot of these men were captured on Morgan's raid in 1863 because there are a lot that surface um, where these men are in jail, especially in Pittsburgh and uh, different places, different Union uh, prison camps. But when you're looking at them, you know, for guerrillas, they, they definitely don't look like guerrillas. Most of these men have on uniforms, and I'm assuming most of these men are officers based on the, the, the double-breasted frock coats that they're wearing there. They, they definitely appear to be officers, and uh, so when you think about guerrillas, guerrillas don't typically look like this. They don't typically have uniforms on, but these particular men right here do, these officers at least. All right, let's go on and look at some other men. Uh, these are some of the en uh, enlisted men, and the man on the far right, he's, he's an officer. His name's uh, Captain Bennett, though. 
But uh, early on when they're first being recruited, you know, there's not a lot of uniforms to be had because they are behind union lines. That is the, the negative part about being a partisan ranger. You will never receive supplies from the actual army because you're behind union lines. It's impossible for them to get that stuff to them. Uh, some of the men, uh, some of the sources, if you read them, they do talk about how they try to match their clothing as much as possible. Uh, some of them have some clothing made uh, by their families and they try to make a lot of that same particular type of clothing where they can all at least some kind of somewhat look alike. Um, and so you do see a big mix though. Um, the man on the left here, that is uh, Captain Lorenzo Dow Fisher. And when you look at him, uh, the description I got from a diary was that he was wearing a Kentucky State Guard uh, uniform, which was as a pre-war state militia. Uh, so I don't know if that's actually the, the jacket that he has on right there or not. Um, but his hat, uh, that looks like a typical Union Army Forge cap there. Now what's interesting is his uh, Henry rifle that he's holding. Um, for a uh, gorilla to have a Henry rifle, that's, that was something. Um, so we'll talk about how they get that there in a moment, but what we'll find out is they don't use them very often, and I think the case for that is because finding ammunition for those behind Union lines is going to be next to impossible. So they have them, they can show them off, but getting able, being able to use them, there's scant sources mentioning that, and you would think that if they were heavily used, you would definitely hear about those things. But um, I just like pointing out, you know, just the differences in dress, the differences in uh, weaponry that they carry. Uh, they are going to be a motley looking crew if they are to uh, ride into your area. Okay, so um, we're going to talk, we'll begin about how does Johnson's campaign begin here. So uh, most famously is the raid here at Newburgh, and we'll kind of get there in a minute. But uh, in the summer of 1862, Johnson and um, Martin, after escaping Fort Donaldson, they did not surrender with the garrison there in February 1862, uh, they eventually get out of that. And they are, uh, they joined the staff of General John C. Breckinridge, who's Confederate general, former vice president of the United States, and fellow Kentuckian. And so Johnson claims that, and this is the only place you can find why he is sent up here, he, it's his own claim. He claims that Breckinridge orders he and uh, Martin back to Kentucky. And when they're there, they're supposed to raise a mounted regiment. Um, the only problem is Johnson and Martin, they've never commanded any sort of large group of men. They've been scouts this entire part of the war, which is beneficial, but when they, they, they haven't commanded anybody. And so they have a hard time gaining recruits. A lot of the potential recruits that they come across, they're, um, they're in their own small guerrilla bands and they don't want to join them because of their age and their inexperience. And so they pretty much tell them, you know, come back to us whenever you show you can prove yourself. And so Johnson decides that that's what he's going to do. So Johnson, um, the first thing he does, I'm actually gonna go to uh, this map right here. We'll jump back to that picture in a second. But what Johnson does, he starts, he, first thing he does, he's, he moves back into his, his home county of Henderson, his hometown. And while he is there, the very first uh, attempt at making a name for himself is gonna be a pretty small thing. It involves one Union Army surgeon who happens to be um, uh, back home for a short time. And this particular uh, surgeon, Dr. Kimberly, he was in 11th Kentucky, he's in a carriage riding around in the countryside with um, some lady friend that he had. And Johnson and Martin, and at this point they had to have one recruit. He's uh, about an 18 year old kid. And they, they, the plan is, let's capture this man. Let's try to make him think we're bigger force than what we actually are. And so as he's rolling down the road, Johnson jumps out and Martin, they you know, pretty much hold him up and um, stop them and they, they start writing out a parole form for him because obviously they're not going to keep him as a prisoner, they're going to parole and put him on parole. And uh, so what Johnson decides to do then is he starts barking out orders as if he has this massive force just hidden in the woods and down the road a little bit. And so, so he starts saying, you know, Captain so-and-so, order your men you know, two miles down the road in this direction. Captain so-and-so, you're going in this direction. And so from Kimberly's perspective, Johnson commands several hundred men um, and so when he is eventually picked up by a Union steamboat and he reports to the authorities what's happened to him, that's the story that he spreads. And so when you start looking at Evansville newspapers, the reports are that there are hundreds of guerrillas operating in this area when in actuality it was three men. Um, Johnson's going to continue that sort of thing. He is actually going to attack the small Union garrison that's in Henderson. 
Uh, there's not very many men there. It's uh, you got some men from a Michigan artillery battery. They don't even have guns or cannons. Uh, there's some men from the Louisville Provost, and so it's uh, it's not really meant to. I don't really, I don't know what their purpose was there. They with the amount of men they had and the amount of weapons they had, they weren't going to do a whole lot. But they are in Henderson, and so a group of these men are really just hanging out at the at the hotel, and they're out on the porch. And Johnson decides that he is going to go into the tobacco. I don't factory is what he called it. Uh, it's where he used to work as a teenager and they're going to set up in there and from that position they're going to fire at these men uh, and then just pretty much run away. And so that's what they, it's middle of the night. Uh, these Union soldiers are completely unsus don't suspect anything's going to happen. And Martin, uh, Johnson, and another man named Owen, they open fire and uh, kill one of the Union soldiers and wound several others. But during this confusion, because they, they do fire off their double barrel shotguns a few times, so they, they get a few blasts on them. Uh, the Union soldiers go up to the top floor of this hotel and they start firing into the night. They, there's nothing there. The Johnson and Martin and Owen have already left, but they just they don't know that. And so anything, any sound they hear, they shoot in that general direction. And they pretty much keep this up all night. And so the next morning they think they have, uh, that they hit several of these Confederates that attacked them because there's a big trail of blood all over the place. But what it turns out to be is uh, apparently they hit a pig in the middle of the night, and that pig was just running around bleeding everywhere. And so they think uh, they hit several Confederates when in actuality they hit zero. And so that story makes to Evansville as well. And the thing about the Evansville Daily Journal, I mean, you can find some amazing stories in there about what's happening in this area. And uh, they typically don't know what's actually going on until several days later. So you'll see the stories eventually change. They'll get the initial story, they run it, it's usually overblown. And then you give it a few days and they start to, you start to see a little more corrected version come out. So after that, Johnson, you know, people are starting to know that this is Johnson. And um, he starts to get some recruits. And so just you know, a few days after this, he's probably up to a few dozen recruits. And while he is encamped in Henderson County, he is approached by a couple of Newburgh residents who tell him that the, uh, the weapons of the Indiana Legion from Warwick County are completely unguarded. They're sitting in in a warehouse right there by the, by the river. And so Johnson, who desperately needs weapons for his men, because some men are showing up without any weapons at all, he needs those, he need, definitely needs ammunition, and he's gonna need more weapons if he's gonna have more recruits. So the plan is to try to attack Newburgh without um, having to really fight for it. So Johnson's plan is really what you see in this picture here, and that is um, create two fake cannons. One is going to be a stovepipe, which is going to lend to his nickname eventually. The other is a charred log. And so when they put those on wagon carriages from a distance, they, they look like two cannons. And so Johnson, uh, he rows across the river straight to uh, the wharf here at Newburgh. While he sends Martin and the majority of the men, uh, they cross on skiffs a little further to the east, where they cross and then they enter Newburgh from uh, the roads. And most of them are mounted. And uh, so Johnson, he he goes to this work, warehouse, for lack of a better word, this, this big storage building, and he, he just sees all these weapons. And the reason they're there is the 3rd Indiana Legion had lost a lot of men to the uh, recruiting efforts of the U.S. Army. And so the Warwick County Legion is not like what it used to be at the beginning of the war. Uh, a lot of their potential um, militiamen have joined the U.S. Army, and so the numbers are low. Plus, the war has moved on so far away. They kind of let their guard down. They feel like the war is not going to touch them here. Uh, because at this point, the armies are in northern Mississippi and down in northern Alabama and Tennessee. So there's, a, there's not much threat of any sort of action, especially up here. So, in, um, so Johnson sees these weapons, but he also kind of sees there's some, you know, people have seen him cross this river. And at this time, there wasn't supposed to be a lot of cross river traffic between Kentucky and Indiana. And so, you know, the word really starts to spread, and he knows that there are several Union soldiers convalescing in the hotel. And so he immediately runs to the hotel, and according to Johnson, this is one of those instances where you gotta, you gotta be careful what you believe, what he says. But according to him, he basically kicks open the door, and when he opens the door, there's all these Union soldiers. They have their bayonets fixed, muskets pointed right at them. I don't know about that, but he goes in, he's got his shotgun, he just starts knocking those out of his face, and just pretty brazenly walking in here. 
and he demands that all of them surrender before his men get there or else they'll pretty much all die. And so he claims that immediately they stack arms and they surrender. Um, I don't know if it's quite that simple or quick, but that's, that's what Johnson says. Uh, a lot of the other people involved, especially on the Confederate side, they don't really say a whole lot about that. But uh, after this gets going and Johnson's men are now in the town and uh, securing the weapons and some other goods apparently too, uh, Johnson notices Union Bethel, uh, the local uh, captain here, and for the Indian Legion, and pretty much, you know, most of you all probably know this, you know, get, that's when he gives him, you know, says, I notice you've got a spyglass for binoculars there, why don't you take a look across the river and tell me what you see, and you know, he says, well, I see two guns, and Johnson pretty much threatens, well, if my men come under attack, their, their orders are to shell the town, and so there was uh, supposedly some uh, extra militiamen coming in from the countryside, uh, Bethel orders them to stop before they enter the town, and Johnson's men get everything they need. They, they get on the boats and they escape back into Kentucky, really just at the right time because there are some steamboats coming down the river from Evansville that are loaded with uh, Union soldiers. And so apparently while they made their escape, um, they do get all these weapons. Some of them are brand new. And apparently some of the men also took some ice cakes uh, from someone's house. And uh, they, what they say, liberated a lot of uh, personal items belonging to a lot of Newburgh citizens. Uh, but um, so with Johnson's move here, this is something that really just propels his name into the press, not just in this area, but across the United States and even into Europe. Uh, you can find the story in British newspapers, you can find them in French newspapers, uh, because this is the first Union town that is captured by uh, Confederate forces. And so Johnson now, because of this, the recruits he gets really start to flood in, and within just a couple weeks, he has close to 500 men. And these 500 men that he now has, he didn't really plan on getting that many men that quick. Uh, he, he's got to figure out a way to arm them. And so what he starts looking for is small Union garrisons, small Union forces that he can quickly defeat and then grab their weapons and the supplies that they have. So he hears about a Union Home Guard force in Hopkinsville who have those Henry repeating rifles. And uh, so he decides to attack them. Uh, and it goes about the same way it does in Newburgh, where not a shot is fired. Uh, he arrives in the town just at the break of dawn. Uh, these men are caught completely by surprise and they surrender immediately and they hand over all the weapons that they have. After that, Johnson hears about Clarksville, Tennessee. And in Clarksville, which is uh, about a day's ride away there from Hopkinsville, here, this, that. Uh, in Clarksville, there is few companies from the 71st Ohio. I believe it's about four companies. And the 71st Ohio has a very checkered past, um, I think rather unfairly. They, they have a bad reputation from the Battle of Shiloh. There was a lot of accusations that they ran during the battle, that their colonel uh, was just the biggest coward in the world, and that might have been true. But the men, when you actually get into it, they, they did not run. They, they fought. Uh, but that's the reputation they get. And so they are sent really to what is considered the backwater, uh, where they can't mess anything up. Send them to Clarksville, Tennessee, there's no one there to fight. They can't possibly mess this up. Uh, the other companies at the 71st Ohio are actually at Fort Donaldson, just you know, a few miles to the west. And so Johnson hears about these undermanned companies that are here in Clarksville. Uh, the thing about the 71st is they have been ringing the alarm bells for several weeks that there is a lot of activity in this area. Uh, Johnson's uh, partisan rangers were one of them, but there's some other little local groups that are starting to cause some trouble, and they are ringing the alarm bells, but nobody is listening to them, and pretty much just is told to deal with it. Uh, so you would think that you know, at a full, at, with, if, if the 71st Ohio actually had four full companies, they should have 400 men. But because of Battle Shiloh, because of all the diseases, and because of all the extra duties that are going on, they actually have less than 200. And so those men are encamped at Stewart College, which is where Austin Peay University is today. And so Johnson's plan is to just surround that place. Uh, down at the wharf, there are millions of dollars of Union Army equipment just sitting there. Uh, because of the drought in 1862, uh, the steamboats couldn't make it all the way down to Nashville, the bigger steamboats. And so they would dump the supplies at Clarksville and then there'd be some smaller boats that would come from Nashville, pick it up and take it the rest of the way. Which several men of the 71st Ohio are actually on those smaller steamboats uh, acting as the guards for that. So uh, Johnson immediately captures that stuff at the wharf and then surrounds 
uh, what remains of those Union soldiers there at uh, Stewart College. Now, Johnson is uh, joined by another Kentuckian here, he, um, a man named Thomas Woodward. He has about 100 men, and he's also trying to raise a new regiment, not as well as Johnson is, because Woodward's had some trouble. Um, before the war, he attended several, what you call, you know, elite universities. Got pretty much kicked out of every single one of those for various reasons. Drunkenness seems to be the biggest one. And when he's kicked out of those colleges, he returns to Kentucky and becomes a teacher. So, <laughs> all things become, yeah, that's, that's what it is here. Uh, so during the war though, he, uh, he does serve in some regular cavalry regiments early in the war. Um, he has a falling hat with several of them because he has a hard time following orders. And so he's sent back here and he tries to raise his own regiment. But Mar uh, Woodward is one of the most interesting looking Confederates I've ever seen. He's, uh, he's got this real long black hair. He's got a big, you know, huge mustache. Uh, he's got these riding boots that go up past his knees, and I think he's five foot four. I mean, he's he's pretty short, and uh, but he is he's got the look, and you know, imagine a big feather in his hat probably too. He, he's got the look of this dashing cavalier, and so, uh, but Woodward knows the area. He's he's from you know basically this area here. So they surround those Union soldiers there, and Johnson claims that this is another part of his book, but it doesn't match up with what other people say. Johnson claims he runs directly for the this uh, school building, uh, the college, or he kicks open the door, runs upstairs, and he finds Colonel Rodney Mason just quivering and shaking in his underwear, not for sure what to do about the situation, and then immediately surrenders. That's not really what the case was, but um, and Martin says when he writes about this event several years later, he says he and Johnson were next to each other on their horses, and they get word that the Union soldiers had already surrendered, and Johnson was very surprised that it happened that quickly, according to Martin. So. I think this is one of those instances where Johnson adds a little bit of uh, excitement to his story to really kind of boost himself. So with the capture of these Union soldiers, Johnson's men have captured hundreds of more muskets. Uh, they're the Belgian muskets, so they're, they're not the best, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the best muskets in the world. They're kind of a knockoff version, if you want to think about it that way. But they're muskets that they need. And so what Johnson's men start to do with those, they, they saw them down uh, because Carrying a full-fledged musket on horseback and trying to fire that thing and load it on horseback, it's extremely difficult. And so what his men decide to do is saw them in half. That way they're much shorter, you can load them a lot easier, carry them a lot easier on horseback, and, and that's what they do. And so while they're also here, they also capture um, a four-pound cannon, which is not very big. I mean, it's a four-pound cannon shoots a four-pound cannonball. That's, that's really small. And so it's, um, they don't have a lot of ammunition for it. They make a lot of their own ammo for it. But they do have an artillery piece, which they will put to use later. So at Clarksville, they are welcomed as liberators here. Um, they're given supplies that was meant for another Tennessee regiment, but they surrendered at Fort Donaldson. And that stuff had been hidden among the people since that time. And so they start handing out hats, they hand out flags. And so Johnson's regiment is now starting to look a little more official. So the next target is going to be uh, several miles to the west at Dover, Tennessee, and where Fort Donaldson is. And, but the problem is Johnson is, the Union's starting to figure him out. Uh, they have heard that he's got supplies at Madisonville. So a force has been gathered at Henderson under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John W. Foster. And Foster is gonna to try to, is gonna make a march to Madisonville to try to disrupt that. But Foster's men are all completely green. They completely inexperienced. Some of them are way under armed and uh, it's, it's not gonna go as well as they had planned. So Johnson splits his forces. He takes a couple hundred men. He rides north to Madisonville and pretty much just holds them off long enough until that supplies is uh, brought out of the city. While the rest of the men under Martin go with Woodward towards Fort Donaldson. And Martin, being the younger officer, he, he gives command uh, to Woodward, even though Woodward has fewer men here. And the plan is to attack the other companies of the 71st Ohio. Uh, so the 71st have, has built a smaller, I don't know if you want to call it a fort, but a small little, little some earthworks in the local cemetery just, just west of town there. Um, that cemetery is still there, and a lot of the headstones in that cemetery are, uh, predate the Civil War, so when you go there, you can, it's, it's pretty cool to imagine you know, those, these things were here when this little fight happened. Uh, they are not at the actual Fort Donaldson because that fort is way too big to be manned by just four companies. And so Johnson and Woodward 
want to try to replicate what's been going on, which is surprise them, make them surrender, and then get their stuff. Um, it doesn't quite work out here because these particular men in 71st Ohio refuse to surrender. And uh, so Woodward's plan is not to necessarily surround them, but to just make a headlong attack right up these steep hills in this area and right at their works. And like most attacks at earthworks uphill during the Civil War, most that it, they're going to fail. And so the, uh, this is really the first negative event that the partisan rangers have experienced so far. Uh, but mostly it's probably because of Woodward. Uh, Martin says he definitely regretted handing command over to him. But Woodward, um, just a few feet away from the entrenchments, his horse is shot. Uh, he has to crawl away um, during that flight, which the Union soldiers definitely make fun of him for that. And they capture his prize pistols that, that he had had there. So after this, uh, Martin leaves Woodward. Woodward continues to stay down in that area. They don't ever reconnect again. Uh, but Martin takes the remainder of the men that he has back up into Kentucky and they rejoin Johnson. And at this point, Johnson sets his sights on Uniontown, Kentucky. And in Uniontown, you have the 78th Indiana, which is a 100 days regiment. Uh, a 100 days regiment is just like they sign up for just 100 days. Um, so you're not expecting much of 100 days men. They kind of join up, they're sent to a backwater, really just to guard something. Uh, nothing's really supposed to happen there. But with Johnson, he keeps proving that thought wrong, especially with the 71st and now the 78th Ohio, uh, 78th Indiana. Uh, Johnson attacks them, and there's a, a brief skirmish there at Uniontown. But those men eventually surrender as well. And Johnson here captures several hundred infield rifles, which are some of the best rifled muskets in the world at the time. So Johnson's men are starting to be very well armed. They also have a cannon, which they used here at this particular battle. So, but Johnson now is going to be facing some more serious Union commanders. Uh, like I said earlier, John W. Foster, he is going to be the commander of the 65th Indiana. Brand new regiment. He was actually here by default. Um, he already got put in command by default. He was really the only one available. He was in Evansville because his brother-in-law had passed away. And when the raid on Newburgh happened, he is immediately thrust into the position of trying to fix this thing. Uh, so he is now put in command of this new regiment. Um, we'll get into Wood here momentarily, but uh, in Henderson, Johnson has, um, sorry, Foster has his regiment. Uh, he is joined by John Platter's uh, 4th Indiana Cavalry, just a few companies of them though. These men are, when they arrive in Henderson, they have never done battalion drill mounted, uh, which is, it's important if you want to expect them to go fight. Uh, they do not have any long arms yet. All they have are their cavalry sabers and pistols. And when men with long range weapons are firing at you, when all you have is a pistol, that there's not much that you can really do, especially when your enemy is also mounted. So when you do try to close with them, they get on the horse and they're brought away. Um, so Platter's cavalry is gonna have trouble until they finally do get uh, the arms that they're supposed to have. But they're also joined by a few companies of the 8th Kentucky Cavalry uh, under the command of James Shackelford, who eventually become a general in the war. But uh, the 8th Kentucky is pretty well armed. They've been in the service for a few months, but they are on the verge of mutiny because they haven't been paid yet. And that is really starting to wear down on these men. Um, they can be good fighters, but when you haven't been paid because of a technicality that cannot be fixed where they're at, the men are getting awfully upset and angry about that. And Kentucky's governor is wiring Washington DC saying, can we just make an exception here? And uh, the uh, Secretary of War just keeps saying, no, you can't do that. And it's, it's, a, it's one of those things where it's like that red tape is just absolutely ridiculous. And this is a perfect example of it. But these men are gonna be the ones that start to figure Johnson out. So um, what happens is after Uniontown, Johnson decides to disband the regiment temporarily for just, uh, just a few days. And when this happens, they are supposed to break down into smaller groups of men, really small squads, and they spread out throughout the entire area and they just hide. Right? It's supposed to be a time for them to rest, get their horses rested, uh, find what other extra supplies they can. And they're supposed to rendezvous at a given point at a, on a given date. Uh, so during this time, uh, Johnson and about a hundred of his men, probably less than that, uh, they go to a place very close to Uniontown up in here, it's called Geiger's Lake. And that's where Johnson, Martin, and a few of his men are going to be encamped during this time. Uh, but they are surprised. Um, Shackelford shows up unexpected, surprises them in camp. Uh, there's a skirmish that's fought there. 
Uh, shock before it gets wounded in the foot, but that little cannon, they just put a piece of metal in it and fire it. And that piece of metal just hits his foot at just the right spot and wounds him pretty severely. Uh, but Johnson is another one of these times where he inflates his numbers just by the way he, he acts. So um, with that particular cannon, they're in a cornfield, he'd fire it, bring it back in the, can the cornfield, it would reappear somebody somewhere else out of the corn, it'd fire and then disappear back in. And so apparently the Union soldiers thought they had several cannons that they were facing when it was just the one. Um, and so they feel like they're outnumbered, so they retreat. Johnson has the biggest scare of his life at this point because he was almost completely just annihilated there and captured. So he kind of learns, okay, this is not something that we can do a whole lot. But the Union has also learned, if you take the fight to them and you surprise them, you can have some success. And so um, Johnson then makes the fateful decision that he is going to leave the regiment temporarily and he's going to go to Richmond, Virginia to turn in his muster rolls. That way his regiment can become official in the Confederate War Department. So that means command is left to Martin. And Martin is young, like we said, he's 22. Uh, no one ever doubted his bravery or his courage or his ability to fight. He is a fighter. But his, he lacks the strategic and tactical thinking that Johnson had. So whenever he is in command of the regiment, it's, it's going to make several mistakes that really make you scratch your head. Like, what, what is he thinking there? <clears throat> so Martin, without Johnson, sets his sight on Owensboro. And this is really where, whenever I was first starting this whole research, I started this whole thing just because I wanted to learn about what happened in Owensboro, and then it kind of ballooned into this. But uh, in Owensboro, there is a brand new Union regiment there. Not for sure what they are eventually going to be. They are either going to be the 15th Kentucky Cavalry or the 38th Kentucky Mounted Infantry. Uh, there was some confusion about what they were supposed to be, and that had not been resolved at this particular time. But they are under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Gabriel Netter. And Netter is a 26-year-old uh, Union veteran. He's fought at Shiloh. He fought a lot of um, small skirmishes at the very early months of the war. Um, he is definitely a fighter. And what some of his men, they thought he might be reckless in command. But uh, Netter is an interesting person. He's arrived in the United States in the 1850s from France. Um, he's from a family of about 10 brothers and sisters, a large Jewish family. And so Netter is the one that is in command here. And what happened in all these other places is not going to happen in Owensboro. So Martin's plan on September 19, 1862, is to try to capture Netter, his men, and all the supplies that they have in that camp. That camp also has a cannon. Uh, they have a, a bigger cannon. It's a six-pounder, which is, but still, it's, it's not the best cannon, it's more of a Mexican War uh, version. And, uh, but they still have several hundred men there and lots of supplies that his men desperately need. So Martin's plan is to send the majority of his men into Owensboro, where they are going to let their presence be felt and heard and seen, uh, gather all the equipment they can there, while he sends another comp few companies to the west of the camp, and they are supposed to just hide out there. Um, so the plan is what Martin thinks, He's going to set up a defensive line uh, just on the edge of the camp there. He expects Netter, who is very aggressive, to exit the camp and then try to retake the town. And while that's going in, these three companies come in from behind, they take the camp, and then they surround Netter and finish him off. That is not what happens because a couple people from town actually make it out and into the camp before this whole plan can be really uh, be put forward. And so Netter has figured out what the Confederate plan is. So instead of going towards the city like the Confederates wanted to, he's instead going to attack out of the camp to the west and drive those companies away. And that uh, really just put a, a big dent in, in Martin's plan. So the thing about Netter, uh, during this time, um, before he can actually start this attack, a uh, Confederate officer rides into camp and demands that they surrender. And Netter, of course, refuses. And one of the things that he says is, you know, never until the last one of us is laid low in the dust. And, you know, he turns around, asks his men, says, you know, does my answer suit you boys? And they all cheer, they throw their hats in the air. Um, and the Confederate officer is kind of moved, I guess, by this, and, you know, salutes him and says, you know, you got my respect, and rides away. Um, Netter then moves out, and he attacks to the west. And while he is out there attacking them, um, he is shot in the chest and he's killed. Um, his men uh, are going to skirmish with these Confederates for about 30 minutes to an hour. They inflict several casualties on the Confederates. And the man that shot Netter, apparently, according to several sources, 
was wearing a white bandana at the time, and so when Netter was shot in the chest, uh, the man next to him immediately saw who it was that shot him, and he took aim at that man and shot him in the head and killed him. And according to a Rockport resident who was writing a letter to her husband in the Army, she said that no one allowed that body to be buried for you know, several days. So um, Netter was a very popular man in his regiment. He's very popular in this area, especially in Evansville, That's which is where he's buried. Um, but after this, uh, Martin realizes, you know, the, that camp is a little more difficult to take than what he initially thought. It's, uh, it's the fairgrounds for Owensboro. So there's a big fence going around the camp. The camp has a cannon into, like I mentioned earlier, and that is not going to be an easy place to take. And I am thinking that Martin's men are beginning to get low on ammunition, especially after the Uniontown fight and some of the smaller skirmishes they've been involved in. And so he sends up uh, Taylor's company just a little bit. Uh, they get fired on by that cannon several times, and they figure out pretty quickly they do not want to go up against a six pound cannon that's firing canister at them, they immediately decide that's not gonna happen. So they, they fall back. Uh, Martin is starting to hear about, you know, the, the Union is not completely uh, deaf to what's going on here. Uh, a couple, well actually one man was able to escape out of camp and he swims across the river, which at that particular time was not that difficult to do. Uh, because of the drought, the water level was so low that steamboats were having trouble going up and down the river and uh, Pretty sure he's probably able to just wade across for the most part. Didn't really have to do a lot of swimming. But the man makes it across, and at the riverbank are men of the 4th Indiana Legion, uh, the, the state militia. And ironically, they are on high alert and they are picketing the river because of the raid on Newburgh. So because of Johnson's raid on Newburgh, that sort of woke the Indiana Legion up to the fact that there is still a lot of threats in this area, and so they are heavily picketing the river. And the 4th Indiana um, Legion is very much uh, alive and well and ready to fight. So after all this, uh, Martin knows that that's what's coming. He sees a steamboat that's loading up hundreds of Indiana Legion there on the northern side. And he doesn't really have the weaponry to um, fight that because the Indiana Legion has cannons on that side of the riverbank and they are firing over across the river to sort of provide cover. So Martin decides he is going to fall back. He gets the ammunition that he needs. He gets the food that he needs out of Owensboro, and they retreat several miles south, and they set up camp there for the night. And so during the afternoon, during the night, reinforcements start to pour in. Uh, you start to get, I think you get about 500 men from the 14th Legion from Spencer County. Uh, you start to get um, uh, some officers uh, that are being sent down here immediately, one of which was, and I'll go back to him here, uh, Colonel Wood. Uh, he is from Spencer County originally. Uh, he, he is a uh, lieutenant colonel of the 1st Indian Cavalry, which is down in Arkansas at this time. But he had been sent back to Evansville to recruit. And so when word gets, reaches Evansville about what's happened in Owensboro, he's immediately dispatched to Owensboro to really take command. So he is there to take command. And uh, several other uh, Indiana Legion uh, units from Ward County and from Vandenberg County are also in the process of getting loaded on steamboats and being sent to Owensboro. Um, but real quick before I move on from Netter, uh, this uh, letter of that we have here it's well not really a letter but it's um it's a translation of the Evansville newspaper account of Netter's death so Netter's sister and his brother-in-law lived in Evansville and so one of them translated the Evansville newspaper about Netter into French and they added his photograph and they sent it back to France and so I was able to get in touch with that part of the Netter family they still had it and so they scanned it and um, sent me this which is the only reason why I was able to see what Netter actually looked like. Um, that was just a chance thing I found on, oddly enough, Ancestry.com. And it's like, I found out, I was like, it was one of those things where, you know, I can't find it, his picture anywhere, and I know there's got to be pictures of him somewhere, because uh, I've seen it referenced in some of the newspapers from back then. And so I thought, I'll just try Ancestry, see if there's, you know, see what I can find on there. And so I found uh, a couple of trees that had him on there, and like, I'll send him a message and see what I get. And sure enough, <laughs> they, they heard the right ones. They actually had this. And so uh, that was uh, probably when I got that email and I actually saw Netter for the first time after I've been you know, researching him for a couple of years, that was an that was amazing feeling to, to finally get that. All right, so as we move forward here, to we'll talk about the Indiana Legion. So the, uh, this is not of the Indiana Legion themselves. This is some militia from South Carolina. But it does give you a good idea of what 
these militiamen looked like. Uh, the Spencer County Legion, which is going to be involved here in Owensboro, they did not have uniforms. So, which is, you know, just exactly, what they, these men from 1860, the pre-war militia, uh, the Spencer County militia, you can expect them to look a lot like this. And so the legion that shows up in Owensboro under the command of John W. Crooks, uh, Crooks is a Mexican War veteran. Um, he has been training and drilling his men very um, thoroughly since the Newburgh Raid. And because uh, he kind of knows that there is a chance that they might be called into action into Kentucky. Or there could be another raid that they would be called up to stop. So he's been training his men, and his men are actually very well armed. When he starts, uh, when I went to Indianapolis to the archives to look at what these regiments, how they were armed, uh, the Fourth Indiana from Spencer County, they had about every musket you can imagine, but excuse me, they're they're pretty good muskets. And so they have Springfields, they have Lawrence uh, muskets from Austria, they have Enfields, uh, they've got conversion muskets. I mean, just about anything you can think of. And so uh, these men arrive in Owensboro, and they find that Netter's camp is demoralized. Uh, his recruits are not, um, say they're, they're not feeling it at this point. Uh, their commander's dead. Uh, they don't even know if they're supposed to be cavalry or mounted infantry. And they are pretty much out of the fight. They're not going to be useful except for about 60 of them, and, that, and that's it. So you have Crooks. He's got about his 500 men. But um, he and Wood start discussing how they're going to deal with the Confederates who are in marching range. They're only about eight to 10 miles south of town. And so uh, the, the, the plan is they are going to take about 350 of this Indiana Legion infantry. Uh, they're gonna take the cannon from the camp and about 60 of Netter's recruits on horseback. And they're gonna march south and attack the Confederates because what they want to do, they want to put an end to this now. They don't want to have to keep dealing with Johnson or Martin, whoever's in command. They want to end all the stuff that's going on right now. So they make a plan to attack at dawn. Um, and so that's exactly what they do. So they begin marching out of Owensboro about 2 in the morning. And as the sun's coming up, that's when they are arriving on the scene. Um, unfortunately for the cavalry, they, um, they start skirmishing with the Confederate uh, pickets. And so they drive in the pickets, not knowing that on the reverse side of this very large hill is where about 800 Confederates are encamped. And so they are chasing these Confederate pickets up this hill, uh, these 60 Union cavalrymen or mounted infantry. And as soon as they get up to the lane that starts going up the hill, several hundred Confederates come over the hill and they start firing right into them. Uh, amazingly, none of the men are actually hit. I don't know how that didn't happen, but I think that just shows you that Martin and Johnson's men are not well trained in the weapons they have, or the weapons that they are able to fire are just such low quality that they don't even hit anything. But it does spook the horses enough who have never been under fire that they just scatter in every direction. And so that's what happens to most of these men. They get captured because they can't control their horses. The rest of them who do get gain control of their horses immediately start to run back up the gravel road. And the Spencer County men say that these horses are coming down the road at such a pace they have to dive into the ditch on both sides just to keep from getting run over. And those men are completely gone and they do not return to help fight. So uh, Wood though decides that he and Crooks are going to continue. Uh, they wheel, once they get to the road here, they do wheel and they start to face uh, where Martin's men here on top of this hill. I'm going to show you what this hill looks like. So the hill is called Sutherland's Hill and from the Union position, this, this is the hill right here. This is from the parking lot of Southern Oaks Elementary School. Um, so I'm in the parking lot from this picture, but you can see there's a modern day church over here. There's some modern houses over here on the north side of the hill. But uh, Wood and Crooks' men are going to advance across this open ground. The Confederates under Martin, for some reason, they abandon this high ground up here and they move down towards the road where there is a fence. Why he does that, I guess he thought the fence would provide better cover, but when, I mean, I'm gonna show you this other picture here. This is a very big hill. And if you've ever seen it, I mean, it's, you get up on the top of that, you can see it very far away. So I took this picture all the way down here, and that's the elementary school. And you can see just the heights of this hill. Attacking up that would have been very difficult, but Martin surrenders that high ground. So what ends up happening is they, um, because Crooks' men, they are very, for militia, militia don't have a very good reputation, but these particular men, even though they're not uniformed, they are very well led and very well drilled and they're very well armed. So in the ensuing shooting that begins for, this goes on for about an hour, they're just trading volleys. 
they start to inflict some casualties on the Confederate defenders and they start to move forward. And as they move forward, the, the Confederates abandon that position at the bottom of the hill and they try to move back up and take up a new position. But at that point, there is a ditch on both sides with a fence. Uh, Crooks' men get in the ditch and they have the fence as cover too. So they are putting their muskets through the fence, the wood of the fence, and pretty much using it uh, for, for cover. And they start shooting down the Confederates and what one man said is like shooting hogs. That really the Confederates, no, no cover whatsoever. They're on the middle of a hill and they are just getting cut down. And so they eventually get pushed back up further. Once they're on top of the hill, Wood and Crooks kind of know they got them on the run. That they start to get that momentum going where if we keep pushing them, you know, we can we can really we can finish them off. So they lead a um, Wood leads a bayonet charge up the hill, and while he's leading his men, his sword gets shot out of his hand, and I guess just the the surprise of that knocks him down, and someone starts screaming out, oh, "Colonel Wood's dead!" and uh, Wood is not dead. He jumps back up, and what he says here. Uh, I always thought it was kind of humorous because uh, Wood is a uh, Southern Baptist preacher and he does not use Southern Baptist preacher language. And so uh, he jumps up and he says, no, you know, kill that damn rebel. And, and so they, they continue up the hill. And since his sword's been shot out, I guess his sword was damaged. He picks up a musket and bayonet from a fallen uh, um, soldier there and continues the charge up the hill. And they push the Confederates off, but not before. The Confederates are able to get their gun, their uh, wolf four pound cannon off the hill. That does not get captured. And the majority of the force does escape. But the thing about it is that Wood is very, very frustrated about is that he inflicted 100 casualties on the 10th Battalion Parson Rangers. And for a small fight, that's enormous casualties. Uh, Wood suffers three men killed, about 30 some odd wounded, and Crooks being a physician back in Rockport, he's, in his report, he lists every single wound that his men get. It's a lot of head wounds, a lot of shoulder wounds, and for some reason, a lot of uh, foot wounds. And he credits that fence that, when they got down that ditch and used that fence, he credits that with saving a lot of his men from the Confederate fire. But back to the retreat, Wood's men, uh, or Wood, is very frustrated afterwards, because he writes in his report that if we had had some more mounted men, we could have chased them down and we could have finished them off. Uh, because at this point, I think one reason they had to retreat so quickly is they're running low on ammunition. You're only able to get so much ammunition for 800 men when you take a town like Owensboro. Like, if, if you find 800 rounds of ammunition there in Owensboro, that's one shot per man. Uh, so the amount of ammunition they have is probably pretty scarce, and I imagine that that's why they retreat and fall back as quickly as they do. They're just running out of ammo. Uh, so they do escape because they are mounted. Uh, Crooks and Wood say they follow them for about half a mile, and then when it's pretty evident that there's no way they're going to catch them, they, they return back to the battlefield, where they start collecting all the weapons and supplies that have been dropped. And oddly enough, they find several weapons that had originally be cap been captured here at Newburgh, which obviously is something that they're going to write about in the newspapers. So after this, uh, the Union starts to figure out the way to deal with these partisan rangers is you need mounted forces and you need to take the fight to them. If you can take the fight to them, you gotta be able to pursue them because they will try to get away. And so that's what they start doing. After this, Johnson does return to the regiment, but he is never able to replicate any of the success that he had earlier in the summer. Um, every time he tries to do something, the Union's learned. And there's more Union cavalry than what they're having before. They're blocking everything that he wants. And so eventually, Mar uh, Woodward, uh, I'm sorry, Johnson, is recalled back to the Army of Tennessee and he joins John Hunt Morgan's division where Johnson eventually becomes a brigade commander. Um, so after this, after they are pushed out of Western Kentucky, uh, these 10th Kentucky Partisan Rangers essentially become uh, the 10th Kentucky Cavalry. Uh, they're, they're not ever gonna act, uh, operate as Partisan Rangers ever again. They're always gonna be with the, uh, with the regular cavalry units now doing raids or with the Army. But during Morgan's raid into Indiana and Ohio in 1863, the regiment is basically destroyed. And so they are never an organized fighting organization after that. Johnson escapes the raid, he gets across the river back into Virginia, and he tries to, with the remains of Morgan's division, he tries to build them back up. Um, in 1864, he's sent back into Kentucky to try to do what he did in 1862. But unfortunately for him, that's when he's shot in the face, and, or in the head, I guess I should say. And his war is pretty much over at that point. Um, 
So Johnson gets captured after that, spent some time in uh, a Union prison. I don't know why they would do that since he's blind. I don't know what he's going to be able to do from that point on. But that ends up what happening. And uh, for Martin, though, interestingly, he uh, joins, I guess what you might call the Confederate Secret Service, for lack of a better word. And Martin's sent up to Canada where he plans the, um, the burning of New York City. And so Martin and several men travel to New York, and the plan is to set several fires in several hotels around the city and try to burn as much of New York as they can. That plan fails. Uh, Martin escapes out of New York. He makes it back to Confederate lines. But after the war, as soon as the war is over, he's recognized when he's trying to get back home, and he's arrested for his role in the New York raid. And he is in prison for a long time. And so he finally gets a pardon from President Johnson. But while he's in prison, I don't know if he was just uh, running his mouth or trying to be um, show that he still has some resistance in him. I'm not for sure. But he starts saying things like he knew John Wilkes Booth. He knew about the plan to kill Lincoln. I don't know how true that is, but that's apparently what he was saying. But he eventually gets pardoned by Andrew Johnson and goes home. Interestingly enough about Martin, he becomes a very wealthy uh, businessman in Evansville, the city that probably hated him quite a bit for the things that he was doing during the war. Um, but then he, uh, he marries a woman, um, and this woman, she's crazy. Uh, she, uh, they get married, they have, a, they have a daughter named Oshie, and the things that begin to happen are things that you would see like on one of those Netflix murder mystery things that have been coming out a lot lately. Uh, so she, um, their daughter passes away under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, Martin's wife had taken out a, an insurance policy on her just before her death, and it looked like that it had been a suicide. At least that's how she seemed to try to make it look like. But obviously it was not a suicide. Um, for Martin himself, he starts complaining of some, some chest problems that he's suffering from. Uh, he thinks it's from a wound that he suffered during the war. He did take a bullet to the chest at one point. But uh, he goes to New York to see a specialist. And while he's in New York City, ironically, he tried to burn that place down, uh, he, he dies there pretty suddenly. And oddly enough, insurance policy had been taken out of him just before that. And so when you're looking back at it, it's like, was he poisoned or something? Uh, it, was, it was a pretty out of the blue death. And so, uh, but his wife, you know, she's starting to get all this money from these insurance policies and it's starting to raise some eyebrows. Uh, she starts to run a school with her sister who is equally crazy. And at the school that they run, some students begin to suddenly die. And it's, she eventually gets found out and put in the same asylum. And um, they, uh, They'll put her in prison. They just say she's crazy. They put her in the same asylum. And but you, you talk about it's the it's front page news in several newspapers. You know just the story of this woman who's just murdering everybody in her family. It would seem. So that went way off from the Parson Rangers. But I always like to show you know what happened to these men afterwards. Uh, Martin's story is just really interesting. And for uh, for Johnson, uh, he lives very long and fruitful life. Writes his book, it's very successful in Marble Falls, Texas and uh, really becomes a town leader down there. Uh, if I go back to these shots of the Union officers, uh, Foster becomes Secretary of State under President uh, Harrison in the 1890s. Uh, Wood becomes the first Baptist missionary to Cuba. Uh, he dies down in Florida. Platter ends up dying pretty early, and Shackelford becomes one of the main officers that's chasing Morgan in 1863. So um, just like I said earlier, these Union officers, they learn. Uh, they learn pretty quickly, you need speed, and you need to actually be able to fight, bring the fight to the partisan rangers if you actually want to defeat them. So that's the uh, conclusion there of my talk, so I'd be glad to take questions if anybody has any. Yeah. Uh, I had some relatives that uh, served in the war, and you seem to have a lot of this information. Is that, uh, you get that online? Did they have did regiments have histories uh, published? Or? Uh, some some regiments do, others don't. It's really frustrating if they don't. Uh, what I was able to use Johnson's memoirs, and even though, like I said, you got to take it with a grain of salt. When you look at the events that happen, I mean, he is pretty accurate on those, and you can corroborate those with other sources that's going on. Um, I was able to find some diaries and some memoirs. Um, uh, one of the most interesting things where I used to live used to be the large farm of the Field family in, in Davis County, Kentucky. 
and uh, it's neighborhood now. And um, so I used his memoir for the book. He, he got captured pretty early on during all this. But he was in the Partisan Rangers, and uh, so I, I lived on his former property. And the school I teach on, they just, just finished building it a couple of years ago, um, really right where his house used to sit. And his parents are buried there right by our, uh, our parking lot. So, I mean, it's uh, always said that was pretty interesting. You know, this, this guy that, you know, he's working and living where he, he lived, and uh, I was able to use his memoir in the book. But, yeah, you can find a lot of stuff online sometimes. Um, that's one of the good things about the Internet now. If I tried to write this 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it just because so many of the sources are online now. Uh, that saved me a lot of traveling. Um, you know, I, I, would, I did have to go to Indianapolis a few times. Uh, a lot of those records aren't online yet. But I mean, it's that was that was one of my favorite things was going up there and actually handling the documents uh, from the, the war. That that was that was really awesome. And just I, I love doing that. I think I went up there a couple more times just to do it, even though I didn't really need to find any more information. I just wanted to go through all that stuff and see if they had. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 hit or miss with a lot of these regiments. Some have very well written histories about their own men, others nothing at all. And that can be frustrating when you're doing the research. How helpful were the ORs in your research? The official records? Yeah, um, they were hit or miss. For the Confederate side, you know, that Johnson writes one report and that's it. And he doesn't go into any of the details. He just says we captured this city, this city, and this city. We captured this much money in supplies and that's all he really gives. Um, on the Union side, you can find some good stuff in the naval official records. Uh, there's but Brownwater Navy was really active along the Ohio River uh, to try to stop him from disrupting river traffic. And so they've got a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, but every now and then you can find some um, little tidbits of things that are happening down in this area. Um, really what I really found some good stuff was the, the telegraph papers and telegraph books of Governor Oliver Morton. I mean, he was constantly just being kept in the loop of what was going on. And so Foster, you don't find his reports in the ORs, but you do find his reports in Morton's telegraph books, because he is constantly communicating with uh, Governor Morton. Uh, Morton was, just looking at this, you know, these events, he was a very hands-on uh, wartime governor, and I think because of his, his leadership, I mean, he, he got a lot of things done. Uh, to make sure that the war did not really get into Indiana more than it did. So, yeah, the ORs, you know, they're, they're kind of intermiss for those. Any questions? Thank you so much. Oh, question. So, was Kentucky considered better than Union or Negro? Or yeah, that's. Uh, we were a very divided state. Um, the Confederacy did include Kentucky as one of their states, even though it never formally seceded. There was a um, secession convention in Russellville, but the legitimacy of that had always been kind of downplayed. Um, when uh, Confederates invaded Kentucky to occupy Columbus, Kentucky, the Kentucky government in Frankfurt immediately sided with the Union. But when you look at men that served, most of the men in Kentucky that do serve they do serve in the Union Army. Um, much higher numbers than we see in the Confederate Army. Um, now, I don't know if that's counting the, the irregulars that don't officially join the Confederate Army. I mean, there were so many guerrillas that pop up, especially later in the war. Um, but, you know, for like my own family history, it's they're half Confederate, half Union. And uh, oddly enough, the Confederate buried the daughter of one of the Union. So, I mean, that was, that just kind of shows you just how mixed it was. Um, but yeah, it was uh, just a, it, it, your area really depended on that too. So certain areas of the state are more unionist in nature, some areas of the state are more inclined towards the Confederacy. So there's a lot of factors that go into determining this Kentucky Union, Confederate, and that's kind of, I, I would say mostly. Questions? 